Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Greetings from the heartland, USA. Steve, you've gone through 10 chapters and you ain't once told me what I, I should do. It's just all been about Christ. When are you going to give me something to do? When's it going to get to be about us? Folks, preach Christ and you won't have to tell folks what to do. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful, so very, very thankful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to, to just fellowship around your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the, the foolishness but seal to our hearts the truth of your word, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Isaiah 65, verses 1 and 2. I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walks in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Note that, after their own thoughts. What they thought was true. Now, we've been studying together in the epistle to the Romans verse by verse. We're about to get to the end of chapter 10. In our last study together, we had reached, I believe, the 16th verse of the 10th chapter. Beginning at chapter 9, the Holy Spirit has been stressing the sovereignty of God among His people and among the nations. And there's an aspect of, of these passages of, of Scripture that deal with national Israel as well as an individual believer in Christ. We looked at the 13th and the 14th verses, uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There's two important aspects to that. One is the whosoever is only, can only be God's elect. And it's saved, not redeemed. Saved is the context, folks, not redemption. Israel is already God's people. We are already God's elect. We need to be saved. It's easy to be very casual with these passages, you know, with a verse like that, because we become impressed that unless, unless a person calls, he's not saved. And so we define saved in, in our own imagination according to our own thoughts. Are you kind of following following uh, along here with uh, the, the logic of this? He's not, sa he's not saved, and, and so we define saved in our own terms to be what's, whatever we think it is. And normally that's being born again, redemption. Most people I talk to, they use the word uh, saved for redemption, propitiation, reconciliation, uh, ransom, uh, you, you know, uh, who knows what. And the inference appears to be that if a person isn't saved, he's going to hell. When the truth is that many who are redeemed will never be saved. That's just the fact of the matter. They'll never be saved in the, uh, in the ongoing sense, the progressive 
sense of the term. And I've spent some time trying to address that. That's another study. I don't want to take a lot of time on that here. The verse says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In modern evangelism, they tend to concentrate on the call. You know, you ought to call. You have to call. When the, when the, the text says that and if you follow this, this, us through this epistle, you've seen this, no man seeks after God. Are we to abandon that verse? No man seeks after God. All have gone astray. Not even those who are his, his sheep. All went astray. The message is Christ. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Without a preacher. The authorized version uh, says without a preacher. Caruso is the word in the Greek, and, and it isn't a noun. In fact, the word occurs 61 times in the New Testament, and 60 of those 61 times, it's translated as a verb. And this is the only place that's translated as a noun, and I, I believe that other translations there have probably translated it as a verb. How shall they hear without proclamation? Our responsibility is not to exhort people to believe or, or receive or accept or, or anything like scare them into hell. You know, Christ is not a fire insurance policy. Our responsibility is to teach the scriptures to present the Lord Jesus Christ to his people, those who will hear. We don't have to worry about the believing. John chapter 10, why don't you believe my word because you're not my sheep? My sheep believe my word. His sheep will believe, folks. They will believe. So the process of believing is absolutely separate from the message. Our message is what God has done in Christ, what Christ has done for you and me. The sheep will believe it. We have the promise in the word that his sheep will believe. They will believe. The promise is certain to all to see. We don't need exhortations to believe. But it does need to be proclaimed. God has redeemed us. We are his sheep because of what Christ did. And he plainly said, my sheep believe my word. I believe God has his own of every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. And I'm sure you also believe that too. And that because they are his sheep, they are believers. However, if they're going to call on him, we need a proclamation. And how shall they proclaim except they be sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things that's what we do that's what we do the gospel of peace he was delivered for your offenses he was raised again because you are made righteous therefore having been justified by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ you have peace with God I have peace with God what do I have to do to have peace with God? Nothing. The message is you have peace with God. It's a marvelous message. And, and man has muddled it up in such a way that, that he's stripped it of its grand truth. You have peace with God. I bring you good news. You are God's elect and you have peace with God. What awaits you folks is a certain hope, a guaranteed hope. What awaits you is absolute victory. He always causes you to triumph. If if you went to, to church, folks, and all that the pastor said was that if he just got up and said, he, God always causes you to triumph and then sat back down, it would have greater results than a whole hour of false teaching based on human merit. I mean, I call it a 10-second sermon. He always gives you the victory. These are the glad tidings. Whether or not you believe that is, is whether or not you're one of his sheep. And, and I have no responsibility in that area. He does. You are not born by anything you do. You are born by the will of God. You are a 
new creation in Christ because of what He has done, not anything that you have done. These are tremendous tidings of peace and good things. And, and if you have followed along with us in, in, in these uh, first ten chapters, you've seen the Holy Spirit present tremendous facets of truth by which we are saved if we believe God concerning these things. We begin then at uh, verse 16, but they have not all obeyed. The good news for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. My Bible says, by the word of God. The word God was, was there in some of the manuscripts, and it's Christ in some of the other manuscripts. So, so here's a verse of Scripture where some of you have it as Christ and some of you have it as God. So what do, what do we, which is it? Well, it's both. It's both. Christ is God. Didn't, didn't take much to figure that one out, did it? I believe there are areas where the Holy Spirit has purposely left a situation where both meanings make sense, and the reason for both uh, meanings is to highlight a truth. Folks, the flesh can't do everything it wants to do. The spirit uh, apparently can't do everything that it wants to do as long as you're in that conflict. As long as you and I are in that conflict, that wretched conflict, which hopefully won't be too long, much longer, and we'll be finally, ultimately saved, delivered from that. So you are believing, you are trusting with the new man, the man created in righteousness and true holiness. The flesh won't ever believe anything about God. The man that's born by the will of God, not by your belief or your trust. You are not born again because you accepted Christ. You're born again by the will of God. You're not saved by the death of Christ. I don't know how many times I've, I've heard people tell me, you know, we're saved by his death. The scriptures say we're saved by his life. We're reconciled by his death. So we need to get our terms right. And I believe that that's what we're being taught here, is that our faith in the new creation is, uh, is that which is there by Christ's word. Verse 18, but I say, have they, have, have they not heard? Yes, yes. Verily, their sound went into all the earth, and the words unto the ends of the world. That uh, appears to be a quotation from one of the Psalms, I believe the 19th Psalm. 19th Psalm. Yea, verily, their sound has gone into all the earth, and the meaning in the Psalms appears to be that, that you know the works of God by looking at the sun, the moon, the stars, and all of that. And there, there might be an element of truth in that. I'm sure there is, but I don't think that that's the application of this verse. If we look at Israel after they heard, you know, they were raised in the knowledge of the law, no matter how much that they were scattered from one end of the earth to the other, they stuck to the Old Testament scriptures. You know, to the to, they stuck to the legalism that shored up their lives. I, I don't want to take a big detour here off into how that, that, that is so comparative to the world religious system today that calls itself Christianity, who does the exact same thing, but... So, just, uh, you know, allow me to go on here. They heard. They were, they were raised in the knowledge of the law, no matter how much they were scattered abroad. Their words went unto the ends of the world. God scattered them throughout the earth. Have they not heard? Yes. Yes. The text clearly says that they, they heard. So there's an essence in which, you know, every human should have known the truth. God made it clear. Uh... It's clear, absolutely clear, that the flesh is not sufficient. Folks, I want you to think about something. This is really goes to the heart of this whole video. The whole, it was the one of the most primary aspects of, 
of truth that I got out of this study that I hope that will come across in the video. The first man, Adam, he couldn't do it. The, the only man through the flood couldn't do it. The man called out of a pit couldn't do it. An old man called to deliver people out of the land of Egypt. He couldn't do it. And now, you know, we come to the stark realization that we can't do it. The apostles couldn't do it. I kind of jumped over Christ, who did do it. That's, that's kind of my point here. And, and I make no apologies whatsoever for saying this, but an, an ignorant, arrogant, boastful, prideful, modern form of legalistic Christianity wants us to believe that we can do it when we can't. Where that when those who are his people come to realize that crucial fact, we are delivered from all of that. We're saved. The flesh is not profitable. And I believe God has spent a great deal of time, that, I'm talking about major historical time here, pointing out to us that it has to be through Christ. Verse 19, but I say, did not Israel know? For first Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. The Jews, of course, you know, felt that they were God's special people, and, and, and all of those outside Israel, were, well, they weren't God's uh, special people. And so God had nothing to do with them, and they had no hope. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is pointing out here that it has always been God's plan to deal with the Gentiles. It's always been God's plan that the Gentiles would also be members of that same family. And here we have two quotations from Isaiah. Uh, I read one from the 65th uh, chapter, verse 1. Another is from the 62nd chapter. So just as a side note, uh, you now have absolute proof that Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah, and now Moses said that God was going to provoke his people to jealousy by a people who were no people. And that's the Gentiles. By a foolish nation, I will provoke you or anger you. And that's again a nation without understanding, referring to the Gentiles. Verse 20, but Isaiah was very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. No man seeks after God. Are you making that connection here? Verse 21, but to Israel, to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gain saying people. So, I want to talk a little bit about that, especially the word gain saying. Folks, as, as just as, as the Jews followed gods that were not gods, so God accepted in their stead a nation that was not a nation, a nation that was not in covenant with him. The modern church presents a God who is not the real God, so God has accepted in their stead a group of people who are not a part of that religious system. I, I should say that again, but uh, I'm, I won't. Uh, if you didn't really catch that, you might want to play back that once. I don't even know if I can say it the same way again. And just as the Jews could not endure to hear of and were exceedingly enraged when the apostles preached the gospel to the Gentiles, the world religious system that preaches a false gospel is exceedingly enraged when his messengers preach a Christ-only gospel, the gospel of Christ, that were born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. And I don't know if I can say that again. If you didn't catch that, you might want to rewind, go back and listen to that again. 
we started out in this epistle learning that man is totally depraved. If anyone is to be redeemed, it must be the work of Christ, not anything that that person does. Not by anything that we did. These, these people weren't trying to find me. He's speaking, he's speaking of the Gentiles. No, they weren't trying to find me. So I caused them to find me. They didn't understand me. They didn't, they didn't see me revealed. So I made, my, I made myself manifest to them. That's what he did to the Gentiles. That's what he did to you and, and to me. But to Israel, he says, remember, that now these are his people. He says, already, you know, we're looking at redeemed people here. We're looking at God's chosen people. You can't set that fact aside. These are his people, folks. He says to them, All day long I've stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and rebellious people. And I have to take issue with most Bible scholars who, who declare the 21st verse is the absolute clear statement of the Word of God that, 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 that God wants everybody to be redeemed, which contradicts previous chapters and verse. This is preached as a universal call of the gospel all day long. You know, I've stretched forth my hands. I've stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And the word gainsaying in the Greek means contradicting people. Contradicting. Anti-leganta is the word. Contradicting people anti and lego people speaking against the word that's what the text says mind blown at least mine was mine mind blown because i've never seen that before i always just I, gain saying i you know never really really bothered to look at the meaning of the word it means contradicting that's what the word means that's what it means if we follow the general theme of thought on this verse, we have to ignore the fact that it was it was to Israel that he said, okay? It was to Israel that he said this. It was to his people. He never said, oh, Rome, Rome, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks? or Damascus, or Babylon, or New York, or Oklahoma City. He said it of Jerusalem. These were his people. And I hear people say, oh, you know, if only those in that sin city, Las Vegas, would come and accept Christ. I just read a goofy commentary on this particular passage this morning uh, that said that, that if they had just believed Christ when he came, well, then they would be a supreme nation now, and they'd be ruling and reigning with Christ. You know, the kingdom age would, would be here. We'd be living through the kingdom age. You and I have been born into it, and you know, you know, it went on. The guy went on and on and on about this, and I, I'm seriously, I mean, you, you got to be kidding me, right? This this is a well. I'm not. I'm not. I don't like mentioning commentators' names, so I won't. But, yeah, they, they'd be a supreme nation right now. We'd be in the kingdom, but they rejected it. Now, what that person is saying to me is that if only Israel had believed, there never would have been a cross, never been a sacrifice, never been a payment for sin. Now, I mean, could, could you even suggest that God goofed? That had they only believed that, that none of this would have been necessary, there, there would be no remission of sin, no redemption, or that I am holy, I stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. Yet somehow, verse 21 becomes God's universal appeal to all humans that He stretches out His hand constantly to non elect Gentile goats. 
Oh, Steve, you're so heartless. So unfeeling. There's nothing about... There's nothing unfeeling about any of this, folks. Am I asked to believe here that the God who said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated, the God who said there were vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, that he really wants them redeemed? Is that what I'm supposed to believe? Am I to read in one passage of Scripture that he endured with much long-suffering vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, and then in another passage of Scripture... Well, he really didn't want to endure them. You know, he wanted to redeem them. If I do that, then then I suggest that redemption is man's work, not God's. And I declare unto you on the basis of the Word of God, you cannot declare that redemption is managed volition. The redeemed are redeemed because God redeemed them. They had nothing to do with that redemption. Over and over again, I point out, why are you a sinner? Because of Adam's disobedience. Why are you righteous? Because of the obedience of Christ, not yours. Yet, but all day long, he stretches out his hand to a disobedient and contradicting people. And in the next chapter, we find out that they'll all be saved. All of God's people will be delivered. They may not have, uh, they may not all have the knowledge of that, but they will be delivered. Dearly beloved, the eternal God, the sovereign monarch of eternity, chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. He elected you to the heavenlies in, in Christ Jesus. And in order to perform that, he had not only had did he have to die in your place for your sin, but to justify you. And, and so he, he left heaven's glory. He became incarnate in human flesh to be your kinsman redeemer and die in your place. And because he died in your place, you cannot die. Then he was buried and forgave you all your sins and in the eternal counsels of God. That stuns the imagination. These truths, folks, ought to leave us speechless. It, they ought to drop us to our knees. He who has made sin was justified in the Spirit so that His resurrection from the dead is the testimony that your redemption is complete, that the penalty paid for your sin was a sufficient penalty so that you can, with the Scriptures, agree that you stand before God without spot and without blame. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.